everything is fine. And we're live. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Art and Activism panel for HBCU Con. Thank you so, so much for joining us. I'm super excited uh, for my panelists that will be joining us today. And um, before we get started, um, I wanted to kind of frame uh, this conversation in uh, in the context of, of three quotes that I want to share with you all. Um, so the first quote is uh, from James Baldwin. And he says, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been concealed by the answers. One more time. He said, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been concealed by the answers. So think about that. Um, The second quote I want you to think about is from Nikki Giovanni. And she says, art offers sanctuary to everyone willing to open their hearts as well as their eyes. One more time. Art offers sanctuary for everyone willing to open their hearts as well as their eyes. Um, And finally, um, from the artist uh, Elizabeth Catlett, She says, I have always wanted my art to service my people, to reflect us, to relate to us, to stimulate us, to make us aware of our potential. Learning how to do this and passing that learning on to other people have been my goals. One more time. I've always wanted my art to service my people, to reflect us, to relate to us, to stimulate us, and to make us aware of our potential. Learning how to do this and passing that learning onto other people have been my goals. So in these three contexts and thinking about art, I see kind of three purposes that um, I want everyone to kind of think about today. And so that's art that is done in service to yourself, you know, trying to lift you up to your higher place or connect to your emotional truth. Art done to service the community as a whole. And art done to affect social change, art done to dismantle systems of oppression. So that's, like I said, some of the framing that um, I wanna kind of come to the story with. Uh, So uh, I myself uh, consider myself more of a literary artist. So I do poetry, um, screenwriting, playwriting. Um, I also am a filmmaker. So many of the artistic uh, skills that I have, of course, are storytelling um, focused, but are also used specifically to tell certain kinds of stories that I feel need to be out there. Um, So that's me in many ways as an artist. And of course, I am not alone in my my thoughts and theories. So um, I wanted to pass it on to my guests. And if you could share your name, your pronouns, um, and your primary art form. Uh, Starting with you, Dwayne. All right. Uh, My name is Dwayne Lawson Brown. I go by Crochet Kingpin. Pronouns, he or they. And primary art form is difficult for me. Uh, Some know me for crochet. Um, A lot of folks know me for poetry and spoken word. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Madeline? Uh, Hey everyone, I'm Madeline Regina. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a theater director, movement artist, creativity coach. I'm all kinds of things, but I think uh, a more accurate depiction of what I am is that uh, a a broader idea of what I do is that I work with people of all backgrounds and abilities and age groups reclaiming their narrative through performance and art. Awesome, thank you so much. And Halima? All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Halima. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and uh, I am a fashion vlogger, primarily on YouTube, but I'm on all social media. And as a uh, YouTuber, I have to plug that all of my social media is Hamel MTV. <laughs> and uh, as I said, I'm a, fl- a fashion vlogger and a interviewer. I like to uh, just vlog fashion, uh, primarily in the, from. New York to DC to LA and now primarily online due to the pandemic. And then I also like to take you behind the scenes and have you talk to the designers, talk to the models and just find out the chaos and the behind the scenes of what goes on at a fashion show or in the fashion industry. 
Thank you so much. Um, so I brought this, you know, diverse collection of of artists together. Where I love I love so many things about each one of them. Um, uh, you know, Halima, I love the way she actually highlights a lot of um, uh, designers of different backgrounds, colors, who are interested in um, making clothes for so many different kinds of people and bodies. It's it's really beautiful to to see the people that she highlights. Um, Madeline, I love how she is able to. Um, allow people to tell their stories through art. And it's this beautiful transition. Um, and I've worked with her as a teacher before. And Dwayne just builds community wherever he is. And it's the most beautiful thing in the world. So I wanted, you know, people to see the different ways that art can be used to, you know, help other people. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, my first question to this panel, what is your artistic art origin story? How did you get started? Um, starting with Madeline. Um, this is an interesting one. So I began performance actually through a body positive burlesque troupe uh, where there were performers of all different backgrounds, styles, uh, abilities, perspectives, and it was a really incredible experience. Um, and the main thing they taught me early on was how to own this physical space you occupy in the world and the power of true physicalized vulnerability. Um, yeah. And at that time, I also started talking to other people in theater. There was a, like a lot of overlap in those communities. Um, and through that, I fell in love with the collaborative storytelling and, and the accessible forms of the art that really do ask you to be in your body and own your space. Awesome. Dwayne? So my origin story is interesting too. Um, so I had always been interested in writing and rapping and, you know, some of my favorite rappers was just like hyper liter literary uh, and lyrical MCs. And I wanted to try to find my lane in that space. Um, and one day I was invited to go to this youth center called Freestyle um, that was ran by this organization called Metro Teen Aids. Uh, that day, they were interviewing teenagers uh, to write poetry and hip hop geared around uh, safe environments and creating and making healthy decisions. And so the first day that I walked in, I brought, I happened to have a book of poetry with me that I've been like just scribbling in one of my notebooks and I interviewed for that job and got it uh, the first day that I came in. Um, and as my career grew in public health, my career also grew within the arts um, and they both have informed each other uh, over the years. So uh, it's a story of arts and activism from the very beginning. Awesome, thank you. Um, Halima, what's, what's your story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I just, I've actually started because my friend, her name is Nikayla, and she is starting a, uh, a hosiery business. So shout out to Rose Covered Hosiery coming soon, look them up. And so what she would do is she was going to different suppliers, different designers, different shows, just to, to get her brand off the ground. And I was like, this is awesome because most people, you don't get to see, you see, get to see the model on the runway, but you don't get to see the chaos or the art that goes on behind the scenes once they get behind that curtain or the designer, what inspires them to design what goes, goes on your body or goes in the store or goes, you know, on TV or anything like that. So I was like, you know what? I really want to just highlight that, you know, highlight a different side because you can find many different things that will show you the finished product. I wanted to just kind of highlight what goes on <laughs> before then and also just talk to the designers because they're just so much fun to, to deal with, to talk to, and it's such a loving and fun community. And then, you know, then I started to get to know just not just the designers, but the makeup artists, the photographers, the models themselves, the, the the textile makers. So I just fell in love and wanted to to uh, to highlight that. And so I started mainly with the uh, with the YouTube. So I started a YouTube channel, and I've just kind of been bumping along with that since, and it's growing, growing slowly but surely. And I love it. I just have, it's more fun than anything else. And like I said, that's I think that's amazing. And I think there's um, th there's really something special to you know using what you have to highlight other people. Um, you know, and to and to help give them 
you know, either give them a voice or, or give them an, an idea of like, hey, you know, your your story is just your story is just as important as the products that you make. Um, you know, which is super vital. Um, was there a, a person or a moment of inspiration for anyone that helped you realize that art could be used for more than self-expression? Like a moment that made you feel like, oh, this could this could be more than than, than just about me. Yo, I, I'll jump in. Um, so it starts with my origin story again, uh, or it goes back to my origin story. Um, so Adam Tenner, uh, he was the executive director of Metro Teen AIDS, and it was his first day. I had been getting myself in a lot of trouble. Um, I was shoplifting, and I got caught um, at a store that I will remain unnamed, and... <laughs> Uh, instead of calling my mom, I had them call uh, my peer education supervisor, who then let the ED know. And the ED came and picked me up. And that day, uh, in my bag, I happened to have a copy of Othello, because uh, you know, school still a thing. So I'm reading this copy of Othello when when I get picked up by this person who just moved across the country, didn't know anything about me, and we talk about like why I was, you know, boosting out of this store. And he he's like, you have a gift. Like there's, there are people who wish they could do what you're doing um, and had the, had the wherewithal to be able to say, this is not about just you. Um, if what, if you don't use your gift, there are tons of people that won't be able to access the care because they you can reach them in a way that I can't reach them. Um, and the mo that moment struck me when it was like, yo, this dude who doesn't know me at all realized that there's something in me that can help others. And that is a moment that deeply helped me uh, so that I could become who I am now. Awesome, thank you for sharing. <sighs> <laughs> Madeline, what about you? Um, when I when I consider this question, it's really hard to pinpoint an exact moment or like a burst of inspiration. Um, but I think for me, it's more of a feeling that I've consistently had from the beginning that I first experienced from the beginning, and developing myself as a theater director. Um, that. I get to create spaces around this idea, um, which is that I love watching and participating in the process of releasing shame. Um, because, you know, as we all live in the systems of oppression and like through our lived experiences, there we there's a lot of rules set up that generate shame because who we are authentically does not match the expectations set by those things. Um, and the process of living out your story through theater and experimenting with aspects of yourself as a performer, it often requires that you contend with that shame um, in a group of other people who are there to do the same thing. Um, and when you do that, that's there's really just something that transforms inside of you that makes you more aligned as a person. So I've tried to bring that into every community that I've worked with, every like group of artists that I've worked with, that's the thing, the core that keeps me moving forward. Awesome. Uh, any thoughts, Alima? Well, for me, it was uh, the person I say that would most influenced it was definitely my mom. She just um, always would just tell me, listen, you can do or be or dress, like any other wonderful parent, you know? And when somebody would come back and be like, cause you know, you and I, Leticia, we're, we're blurs, okay? We love all of that. And I would, like one time I dressed up as She-Ra and somebody told me, well, you can't dress up as She-Ra. My mother was like, what? No, went and got me the She-Ra's she costume ever and sent me to the next uh, place. to. And so ever since then, I just always try to never temper myself down or anything like that you know always just uh explore dressing artistically and all of that and since my family they're big into sci-fi and all of that so star wars star trek so it's always about expanding imagination and then for me it was more like well let me see how we do that with with clothing and how we express ourselves 
with the way that we dress, especially in the DC area. Everybody thinks that, you know, DC is just, okay, Congress, and then that's it, <laughs> you know, but it's not, there's diplomatic dressing. There's also people when they're done with their day jobs, you know, they do all, all sorts of other things and how they express themselves in the way that they dress. And then I started to look more into, okay, another thing that my mom also um, impressed on me is respect the people that make the things that you use. So it's always, you know, like the gardener that gardens, guess what? You now you have beautiful flowers that you can look at and enjoy. And there's a lot of work that went into that. So I was like, let me apply that to my passion and find out what goes on behind the scenes with the, the top that I'm wearing or, okay, oh my goodness, I have a I have an event at an embassy. I can't show up at the embassy in some, some jeans and a t-shirt. Okay, so then I said, okay, what goes behind dressing to go to an embassy versus dressing to go to the movies or anything like that? So that kind of, uh, that kind of inspired me just to, you know, see how people express themselves in the way that they dress. That's awesome. And I also think of just like that, that, that expansion of like, you know, the, the, you know, whatever you make, what goes out in the world and how do people feel when they're wearing or seeing whatever you create it? You know, so you have this, um, you know, this uh, ripple effect, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then also, you know, both uh, both Madeline and Halima, both you kind of talk about um, living within your body, you know, and, you know, whether it's, you know, what you express or what you put on it, you're like living within my body and accepting that affects how I move through the world, affects how I how I interact with others, um, and you know, and that again, that can have massive ripple effects. I know with me, um, I just I fell in love with so many things at so many different points in time, um, and even though it's media, well, actually, I, actually, I do actually want to answer this question for myself. Um, I remember my mom and I, we lived in, um, we lived in a place called Glen Oaks and there was this one woman show and it was a one woman show about Harriet Tubman. And it was in this tiny little corner. Um, I don't know how they got the space, but they were like, apparently they were literally like seeing, like begging for people to come in. It had to be four. Hmm. And this woman put on this entire show with this tiny audience and I was absolutely transported and and um, just embodied this amazing woman, embodied Harriet Tubman and also told me this story, which I can still tell you about over 20 years later. You know, and the idea that you could have that impact on someone and possibly I could have that impact on someone at a later date. Like that was something that just blew my mind at the time. And then realizing that even if I'm writing, my words could be somewhere that I wasn't and still have an impact. Like those were things I was like, okay, this this power that you have to tell a story that could affect someone's heart is something that is important and precious. Um, and worth taking care of, you know, and you need to be aware of it. I love that. <laughs> uh, so um, speaking of that, um, how have you or others in your circle used art as a vehicle for social change in, you know, for what specific community? Um, well, well, Madeline, you can start. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, okay, so um, I'll give uh, two examples because I think that they um, they give um, some underpinning of like connection of what the uh, things are really important to me that I was talking about before. One of which is that I direct with one of the inclusive theater companies at Artstream where all of our performers are neurodiverse. Um, and what Sorry. that ex mm -hmm. For people who don't know, neurodiverse means? Oh yes, uh, for neurodiverse, uh, that can well, mean a lot of things. Uh, for In this particular instance, um, it is somebody who lives with a cognitive disability. So that can mean anything from autism to uh, Down syndrome, 
all kinds of things, the broad spectrum. Um, what the process of making stories within that community has really taught me is that um, self-expression can be inherently subversive because the stories that we devise together, um, they aren't about the experience of disability, but by virtue of taking up space, it demands a level of recognition that I am just constantly like in love with. Um, another one is that I work with the theater lab doing the life stories programs there. Um, I went through their life stories Institute, which teaches you how to use uh, theater techniques, specifically theater of the oppressed, uh, to help people of any background, any like level of experience, uh, share true life stories and create a, a work of theater with through that. Um, and that taught me the power of like processing and honoring your truth, because the the people that I've had the opportunity to work with. Um, weren't actors before and then really found their voice and became actors through that process. And I feel like that ripples out into the community. It's like once I feel actualized and aligned, like I want others to feel that as well. Awesome. Uh, Halima, uh, how have you seen you, how have you or other people in your circle used art as a vehicle for social change? And well, I think, I think mine is, it's, it's pretty easy, it's fashion. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, it's as simple as putting, buying a shirt that has a message that you want the world to see um, that reflects your worldview. But um, personally for me, what I did was, you know, especially when the pandemic started and just everything just kind of changed, I was like, you know what, what can I do to impact in my small little channel? And so what I did firstly was I started to highlight designers continue to highlight smaller designers who are just trying to band together to make it, you know, through the, because one of the things, it's not like you're trying to survive and you're like, oh, I have to go buy a designer gown or anything. So how are people um, changing their, their way? And one of my, uh, like, for instance, one of the designers, uh, A4Sam, she does a uh, she used to design, and still does, by the way, glamorous gowns for, for balls and galas and things like that. And then she and other designers pivoted into making masks, making uh, however they could help out uh, people at hospitals and things like that. Or, hey, the service member's getting married. Let me go in ahead and uh, make them a gown for free or anything like that. So that's one thing that, you know, I like to highlight and see how they were making the change. And then also I highlighted sustainable designers. I was looking out for people who were eco-friendly or or um, there's a designer out in California. Her name is Deborah Lindquist and she's, she focuses on a sustainable uh, eco-friendly design. So I wanted to highlight that. And then just also personally for myself, I looked out and hi highlighted Native and Native American and, you know, uh, designers. Um, there's a designer out in, uh, in, I believe it's New Mexico, and if it's not, I apologize, but it's a, uh, their name is Akunav, and they design these beautiful, beautiful, sustainable, because they've been designing that way for ever. And I was like, okay, I'm going to highlight people that not no longer focusing on like fast fashion or anything like that, but just try to highlight people that design in a sustainable, environmentally friendly way, but also highlight more marginalized designers as well, because they're, they're the hardest hit when it comes to our current situation now. So that's how I tried to kind of pivot and highlight in my little neck of the woods. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Uh, Dwayne? Well, one, I want to say shout out to Halima. You're dropping like all the names so that folks can like immediately go back. I'll be listening back to this like, okay, who's that designer? Who's that designer? Let me go ahead and support this person. You know, so thank you for that. Um, so poetry, right? Um, the For me, as a writer, I aim to say the most with the least words. Um, so that I can have the greatest impact and not hold people up, like, you know, given all this, you know, information, um, how can I get that impact across in the fewest words? And uh, that's been so much of my career. Um, with Whitman Walker Health, 
uh, slash Real Talk DC, um, when we moved to the pan, when we've transitioned from in person uh, to digital programming during the pandemic, a lot of it was taking our core programs, so uh, things geared around HIV uh, uh, prevention and treatment uh, for care, uh, care for folks living with HIV, um, conversations around. Uh, relationships and, and sexual identity um, and, and identity in general. Um, so much of that uh, needed to change structure and the goal was to just infuse art into all of it, to make all of it more palatable. Um, it is a lot easier to digest a three minute poem about uh, HIV and living with HIV um, than a 15 to 20 minute lecture about uh, HIV prevalence within the city, you know? And so really marrying artists uh, who have the skill to craft those messages, um, marrying them with the cause that really speaks to their spirit. Um, for me, it's been poetry and health and wellness. Um, it's been racial justice. Um, it's been social justice in general. It's been identity in politics. So that's really where that 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 passion shows up uh, is through the poetry. I just want to like I like I have to do a mental re rewind of that of just like marrying the skill of the artist with the cause that inspires their passion. Like that is oh that is beautiful. Just, uh. I mean, that's you put together this amazing panel. Like every person on this panel is doing that exact work, including yourself. So thank you. Including yourself. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, uh, okay, more questions, more questions. Because facilitation is one of my skills and I'm using it, man. <laughs> um <laughs> Okay, so, um, and you, you kind of already led into this question, um, Dwayne, um, actually everyone has, but I still wanna you know, zero in on this. So it's been said that we're kind of in the middle of like this, you know, second civil rights movement, uh, if you will, just like this, you know, huge, um, you know, political change, cultural change, um, somewhat of a cultural revolution, if you will. So what do you think the role of art is to meet this moment um, where there's you know, so much conversation about these um, issues that we literally have been dealing with you know, for centuries? Word. Um, my brother Drew Anderson, um, he said in a poem uh, that the poets are the town criers. Um, folks shouldn't have to watch the news to receive the truth because we're part of the community who, you know, we're, it's our job to translate these things. Um, there is a belief that we as artists experience some of the wildest things so that we can translate them <laughs> to, uh, to a format that folks can receive and hold on to, um, something that folks can wear, you know, something that folks can, can experience and uh, be able to tell their stories as well, to document their personal history. Um, and so I think about Marvin Gaye's work, you know, what's going on? What's happening, brother? That could have came out last week and it would still be <laughs> as relevant as it was back then. Um, and so, there, yeah, art art has been showing up and the artists uh, have uh, a responsibility to, to show up, not necessarily out at every march, not necessarily um, with every song or every poem or every item that you create, or, uh, but, to tell their story um, and to help amplify the voices of those who don't have the platform to share their own. Mm. Beautiful. How, how do you follow that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, no, we can try. I mean, because, yeah, I just. <laughs> I mean, I think for me on, on my end within the, the fashion sphere, I do find that yes, okay, we are in a second, well, I mean, I think it's a continuing civil rights movement that has just, there's something that 
has more focus now or you know the the pandemic has really highlighted a lot of inequal inequalities that we were just kind of living with because we thought that huh, that's just the way it is and now it's like okay whoa 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 that's not the way it is that's or if it's the way it is it needs to change because it's not right and when for instance, you know, if you have a, a fashion show and then the, the designer is just like, you know what, I want all of my models to be paid. Why aren't the models being paid? That's that's a way to affect change as a, a designer, just changing the model's life. Because guess what? Then they can go in ahead and and get, you know, get food or, or anything like that, you know. So that's one way that they can affect change. And another way would be also if if a designer or or anybody has uh, the ability to, like I said before, make clothing for people that, or donate clothing or, or donate masks or anything for people in need, that's a small way that they can do it. And, the, and ways that I've seen designers do it, I see that they're making change and affecting change in that way within the industry, you know, making sure, okay, let's, if the models are getting paid, get them health insurance or, or, or do something because you know they can't you can't really now you know it's opening up a little bit or you're having virtual shows but you know it's not it still hasn't recovered so let's see how we can get together and support people during these times and make it make it permanent you know so that's that's the way that i'm i'm seeing that it's it's changing within within my sphere. And then I also am seeing more designers just speak up and say, listen, this is what I believe in. This is what my label stands for. This is the passion that I had in my heart when I made these clothes for you. Take it or leave it. But this is who I am. And I really, really like that because before it was just kind of like, okay, well, you know, we're all here. Look at my clothes. Now it's like, listen, my clothes stand for this because this is who I am. So I like that. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, Madeline, what do you think? Um, I think you, I think art is an essential piece of, of social movements. I think um, it's completely necessary because it gives communities a chance to process the needs and perspectives of its citizens. And without that step, you only are hearing a fraction of people. Um, and then those are the fraction of people being served by the system. Art has a way of like making space uh, and, and giving us a, a common um, common vocabulary with which to discuss uh, different topics. And it also takes it out of the realm of theoretical because you can't like debate things as if it's theoretical or just a philosophical quandary when somebody is standing right in front of you saying, this is how I experience the world. Um, I think that that is such an important element to it. And I also like want to just throw in there about the, the, the significance of like privilege and the tools that privilege has afforded me and that if you have privilege, it's so important to uh, like offer the tools that that has given you to to anybody who might need it, and and to listen. Like the core of that being listening and offering when necessary. So I wanted to throw that in too. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that's that's just one of those vital things, and just. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've got nothing to add. You guys just keep on dropping yeah. them, and I'm like, I hope that there are people out in the ether sphere just collecting them, you know, you know, and you know. Now, now I think of gems and Sonic and Mario. Do, do, do. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, what, what we've been talking about so far has been mostly been kind of like art on the ground, right? Like in our communities, people we can talk to, all of that. But of course, there's like the big media companies: Disney, Paramount, Marvel, Warner Brothers who honestly, even though it's kind of like commercialized art, it's still in there. Like that's often people's first experience of, you know, animation or storytelling or, or all of that. And these companies have started to produce media that tries to, some more successfully than others, um, to speak to very social issues of our time. You know, you know the, the, the uh, season finale of, of uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier just dropped, you know, and it tries. It, it tries. does. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it tries. It, it, it tries. 
But um, what influence do you feel that, you know, the media that they're producing, um, what does it, what effect do you think it has on artists, you know, um, you know, nascent artists like five-year-olds being like, ooh, uh, you know, and, you know, artists like us or, uh, or communities on the ground, like, what do you think is the, the effect of this media that is coming out having or attempting to have a little bit more social consciousness? <laughs> all of us are like, like <laughs> it's like a double dutch. We're all kind of like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Dwayne. You got this. All right. Um, so I think of, I think, I think about like Black Panther, right? right? And you know, the the impact that that movie had was so much greater than I think Disney even anticipated because that was the it was a black superhero that like families could go see because for me it was blade like when i went to see blade i was like yo my man wesley snipes giant getting it and like he's like slicing up like and, and like that was me and my i was in full goth wayne mode like and i was inspired um because there were there were hints of a very human story in a format that uh that felt ex extraordinary um but you know ultimately he was dealing with grieving uh, the loss of his mom um throughout that movie and you know no spoilers on a like what 21 25 year old movie <laughs> um he ends up having to deal with that uh with that that issue um there are like the morsels of uh of humanity that we can find in these stories i feel like i want to see the the pandemic i feel like they're they with falcon and winter soldier they really wanted to nail it and like go hard and then the pandemic happened and they had to rewrite a bunch of things that happened in that story um and so some of the choppy nature uh may actually be a result of things that they had to cut out due to the pandemic um, so I would love to, to have a version of that story where they didn't have to feel like they needed to make concessions um, and just, you know, we, the, the major pieces, the major uh, companies, they're inspiring artists um, at a very young age to believe that it is possible that they can do this. Um, and they've been hiring folks that a lot of us know, like ta Coates Coates um, and uh, Jason Reynolds. Like these are folks that were specifically in DC, you know, doing, doing the art scene and the poetry scene and writing for Howard's newspaper. And they're ending up being hired by these major companies to create uh, the large scale. And so uh, we see a pipeline for where our stories can go. Mm. I think that the companies, they already know what they need to do. It's been very obvious for many, many years that diversity makes money. I mean, Fast and Furious is coming out. Well, they're going into space, okay? <laughs> We're going to go see it because we want to see people we want to see diverse stories that diver that uh, show diverse viewpoints, okay? We don't want to be fed crumbs and morsels of, okay, well, we, you, know, we have a, you know, we'll have a special day for, for diversity, diversity day, or anything like in Hairspray, you know, just we're going to have a diversity day or whatever, <laughs> you know? So they already know what they need to do, okay? Um, all they need to do is just continue doing it. They need to continue having more diverse viewpoints in either the boardrooms or or casting or whatever. Just continue opening up and just diversity sells. Diversity makes money. You, you, going back to Black Panther, I mean, it was an entire movement. You know, I mean, fashion wise, for me, I grew up in the. Uh, Eastern and then Southern Africa. So I grew up and wearing clothing that one, my, I was in touch with who my ancestors were. I 
grew up with with uh, with all of that. So that wasn't such a big deal for me. But just to and like I said, that's just my experience, you know, my experience growing up. So then when I came here and it was like, oh, my goodness. And I was like, wow, I really have to document this because people are looking for a connection. People are looking for a connection. People are looking to express. But people are also wanting to see different viewpoint so they're there they can go in ahead and swahili is called kitenge the the african print so you know they're putting on their kitenge they're going to see the premiere there there are scholarships made friendships made you know i mean it was great just for my little channel black panther just changed the trajectory of everything because i met so many designers so the thing is you you're, you're meeting diverse people and all that and then now like for instance mortal kombat's coming out people want to see <laughs> diversity it doesn't have to be a uh, citizen kane okay not every single movie doesn't have to have to be that okay we just don't want to see the same old same old diversity makes money just get on it and continue it you already know what needs to be done the studies are there the article the same article comes out every every year oh, <laughs> every year what? every six months at this that's point what? <laughs> you know i mean we wonder woman i mean wonder woman made so much money because people wanted to see wonder woman and wonder woman was one of the few movies that was like it has to be good so that we can have more female it shouldn't be that way Okay, it shouldn't be that way. No one says, okay, Batman's going to fail. We're never going to make another Batman movie. But let Wonder Woman crash and burn, then, you know. So, okay, I'm done. But yes, diversity, just do it. Continue. Get it done. Done. <laughs> and I can't, I can't add anything to that. That was like, that is, <laughs> yes. That is, the, and I think just continue to demand honest, authentic storytelling. Yes. That empowers and inspires. You gotta be, yeah. I think you did it perfectly. <laughs> um, and actually, I actually do want to want to trajectory from that, um, Madeline, just because I feel like, and and Dwayne, you kind of led into it, just this idea of that, like sometimes you know, with the pandemic and some other stories, if things get get truncated or if things don't, you know quite work the way they're supposed to because there is something to be said for um either authentic storytelling or um nuanced storytelling you know because you know just like you said Halima like it makes no sense that whenever you know uh, uh a movie that features you know uh people from whatever marginalized entities who you know are not straight, are not cis, are not, you know, are, are have disabilities, have, you know, whatever, whatever modulation that they have, that everyone's like, cross your fingers so this doesn't fail because they'll never do this again in 20 years if it flops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's no reason why that should be the normal. There's no reason why we should always be in this like mild panic um, that, you know, that that might happen. And then there's, I, th I feel like there's also this kind of weird, um, not weird, but th there's this interesting thing I feel with um, with tokenism, just because one, you don't want to have tokenism, but <laughs> when there has been tokenism, it's been really interesting because sometimes when, even when you've been the only one, that person's status is, a, is essentially elevated and that becomes this, inspirational thing you know it's it's this very kind of odd continuum i think about um one of the things i think about is uh is kendra and buffy um you know kendra was there for what four episodes maybe four episodes and changed my life exactly <laughs> i know she changed your life <laughs> right and it's like you know how you know had this you know whack behind an accent that bianca didn't do well but they didn't teach her anything and, and, and you know all these things happened yet you have this character or you know like Rachel Chu in the craft you have this one character who is very much like you get to latch onto and that becomes an inspiration even though you want better like again interesting continuum or um oh god I'm blanking Even recently just with like Black Widow and the Avengers she's the she she was the one for the longest time or even my beloved Wonder Woman she's the one for you know mostly the one for everything and so everybody gets to put their their interpretations and their wants and their hopes and everything and she's just not free to be just kick ass Wonder Woman <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> and, and and the question is also like, you know, what 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 story does that tell? How does the how does it affect, you know? And then again, this is this is us talking about like the big corporate stories, and then you have us on the ground dealing with okay, what is the impact of those big corporate stories on the on the people who we meet who who may be in our theater companies or who may be at our poetry events or who may be you know in our fashion? Like, how does it affect like everyone else? So like. Just interesting th thoughts. I you know. do want to say real fast before we move on, a show that gets it right consistently in my book is not 100% perfect, but our our Star Trek Discovery. I love it. It's diverse. It's got diverse viewpoints. You don't have to just focus on one person or character or anything. The, the, the writing is just on point. So if we could get like more of that, hello. That's all. Okay. Dwayne, you want to say something? Well, uh, I, I feel like uh, with tokenism um, in the major stories, we end up uh, when you find yourself in one of those spaces where you're the only one, you feel all of the pressure to be superhuman because their only example of the other um, has been this superhuman character, uh, caricature of your identity. And so you know, people expect all women to be Wonder Woman. Um, they expect all of us to be cyborg and booyah our way through the day. And it's like, <laughs> no, like, nah, I'm not, that's not who I am, so, yeah. yeah so. Let's let's diversify people's idea of diversity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, one of my next questions. Uh, so for artists who do want to get involved in activism, who do want to, you know, use their art to, you know, serve other people, what is your advice to them? How, you know, what would you, you know, recommend? Hmm. <laughs> I think um, really be affected by stories that need to be told, whether that's yours or somebody else's, then build a community around telling that story and use the tools you have to give that life. And definitely stay firm in your values because they, they may not be reflected uh, by the world around you or uh, by the systems that you're trying to work with, but you have a unique part of the puzzle that's just yours that you can use to start changing that. That is so important and so true. And that's that's basically, I guess, what I would say just to, you know, kind of build upon that is just, you've got to listen to your instincts, okay? If it does not feel right to you and you've, you've already been in a situation where you're just like, I don't know, I don't know about this, then guess what? Just listen to that inner voice. I know it sounds corny, but just do it. Just, just don't, just stay aligned with your values. Make sure that the message that you're putting out there and the message that the, either the organization or the person or the event that you're going to be uh, doing your activism at or aligning yourself with match, that you feel that you will be proud to represent it. You know, because at the end of the day, you have to go home with you <laughs> and you have to lie down and be like, oh, my God, what just happened? You know, so absolutely. My advice, listen to your instincts, research oh, and research. Absolutely research. <laughs> OK, because somebody can say, oh, this fashion show does this. And then you look at it and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This fashion show is sponsored by such a, a B and C and my values don't align with A, B, and C. So yes, there the event is this, but at the end of the day, it, it supports this. And I, I just cannot be, and then don't feel bad. Don't feel bad, stay firm in your resolve. Just don't be afraid to say, no, I'm, I, I cannot support this. I cannot do this. And then move on with your peace and your power. There. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like y'all said it all. Um, I was like, okay, I'm gonna be the one to say the no. Oh, oh well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't be afraid to to uh, hold the door open for others as well. When um, when you find yourself in a space 
and you recognize like, oh, I have this passion and I know somebody else who also has this passion, hold the door open for them too so that they can come in. Um, because the more people who are speaking on causes um, and using their art, uh, the wider the reach. Amen, amen. Just, yeah, just take all this with you home. Let this, you know, please just take all this with you home. And so uh, it has been so amazing talking to each one of you in this past hour. Um, so the last bit, uh, tell to can you tell the people um, again who you are, what you do, and how can they support your work and or find you on the interwebs? Uh, let's start with you, Halima. Okay, all right. Well, uh, Halima, Hamalam TV, it's right there on the screen. Um, it's Hamalam TV on YouTube, where I mainly am. And since I'm a YouTuber, I have to say like, comment, and subscribe. Hello. <laughs> but I'm also on Twitter, I am on Facebook, and uh, you can reach me at Hamalam TV at gmail.com. And uh, I am a, uh, mainly a, a fashion style and events vlogger. I uh, like I pivoted now due to the pandemic to covering virtual events, but I like to cover fashion shows with a purpose. I like to interview uh, fashion designers, makeup artists, photographers, and just creatives in, in, in general. I just like to highlight the part that you don't see. You get to see the model walking down the runway. I get to show you the makeup artist that redid her face in five, in five seconds flat, and then the, the, the person that ran to get the different shoes and somebody pinning the dress, you get to see that on my channel. And so if you, if you like that and like to find uh, designers and, and outfits and things like that that you don't really see, and also just discover DC's vibrant fashion scene, because that's where I am right now, then please like, comment, and subscribe. Boom. <laughs> Awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to you because I know you also have a list of plus size designers. So just like, yes. so yes, I can come back to you in a I second. Do. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> uh, Madeline, uh, how, tell them people more about yourself and how they can support your work that's coming up. Ooh, um, well, a lot of theater things have changed because of uh, quarantine and the pandemic. But uh, the thing that I am most excited for right now is this summer my friend and I are launching a podcast called Feminist Fairy Tales that repurposes the genre of uh, fairy tales to tell intersectionally feminist stories. Letitia is actually one of our first season writers. We are so excited to have her. Um, and also the one of the really big things for me right now is my creativity coaching business. If you want someone to walk alongside you uh, through the journey of art, whether you're at the beginning or you're still developing your process, it is always helpful to have someone uh, help address your blocks, help use creative means to, to figure out your goals. Um, so yeah, just find me on Facebook. I don't have a uh, website just yet, but find me on Facebook uh, at Metal and Regina, and I would love to be a part of anybody's journey. And, and, and Dwayne, Dwayne, I want you to plug everything. So that means that means poetry and crochet and et cetera. Go. Bet. All right. Dwayne Lawson Brown on Facebook. Um, I am not on Facebook as often as I probably should be. Um, at Crochet Kingpin, I so I crochet and make assorted things. Um, I've made cosplay for cro like crochet cosplay outfits and uh, a lot of scarves and hats um, and things like that, um, blankets, etc. cetera. Um, so crochetkingpin.com, um, crochet kingpin on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and all the social meds. Um, I also uh, work with Whitman Walker Health, nonprofit organization slash federally qualified health center. Um, and so we have Real Talk DC. Uh, Real Talk DC is our youth services division um, geared around raising awareness um, and helping people live their healthiest lives. We don't turn anyone away. And you can follow us on Instagram at Real Talk DC underscore um, for all kinds of great and amazing things. Um, Let's see, poetry. I am launching a podcast as well. Um, so uh, shout out to, to the pod fam. Um, <laughs> I will be using Stereo app 
uh, to uh, host a poetry uh, conversation series called Poets Reading Poetry um, <laughs> and Other Redundancies. So yeah, um, <laughs> that, uh, that will be launching May 4th. Uh, so may the 4th be with you at 8 p.m. Uh, so if you wanna know more about that, you can follow any of the other stuff and that'll be there. Um, Spit That DC, DC's longest running open mic. Um, we still host virtually every Thursday um, and that's hosted by Drew Anderson, AKA Droopy the Broke Baller, AKA Mr. Spoof School. Um, and that is every Thursday and then Spit That Academy, um, Spit That in Residency um, and that's with Willie Mammoth Theater and we host that every first Monday except Next month, uh, we're doing May 10th, um, and you can watch that on Facebook Live. Whew, a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like all I because, said. All because Letitia said do them all. I was like, oh my gosh. Because people need to know. People need to know. And if you were wondering, yes, the scarf and the, the, the headpiece that is behind Dwayne are his pieces. And, and I know you were thinking like, really? Yeah, that's all him. Um, and finally, uh, there's me, of course, Leticia, uh, my uh, Twitter, as you can see on the name, Leticia Creates. Um, uh, you can find my podcast, Introspectional, uh, where we have introspective, intersectional conversations about speculative media. Uh, you can find that pretty much wherever you get your podcast. Um, Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify. So that's uh, my newest project as well as a uh, reading um, that I'll be putting together soon, um, which will be my uh, retelling of Pride and Prejudice. So all or majority POC cast, modern considerations put in and hopefully a lot of fun. So that's, uh, so be on the lookout for that um, from me. Uh, so the very, very last thing I wanna do, I only have a couple of minutes. Um, you did all your plugs, Dwayne. I, I Madeline did your plugs, Lumi did your plugs, but I want you to plug again, but <laughs> plug other people. Okay, so, I absolutely so things, things that you can think of. And, and remember, I mentioned you know the, the, the plus size of designers that you know, so other people that you think folks watching should check out if they are okay. curious again about arts, activism, community engagement, community art, all of that. Uh, okay. Starting again with you, Halima. All right, so I'll start with, uh, um, I have to first shout out my full figure plus size community. They've been so fantastic and you wouldn't think that they're marginalized because a majority of, uh, of people in America, they are um, full figured or plus size, but they don't really get the shine that they deserve. So I wanna shout out Madeiro's Fashion PR and you can check, go on my page. She is the first PR firm solely just, um, de devoted to plus size models, uh, plus size designers. So check her out. Uh, fashion designer, Sean Denise, she is celebrating six years. She has these fantastic designs. District of Curves, they're in, in uh, North Carolina. It's just a whole week of just, they talk about health, they talk about uh, networking and a spectacular fashion show. The one here in DC is District of Curves. They are amazing. Uh, the, just a whole day of just nothing but spectacular fashion. And also it includes plus size males as well. So uh, plus size men, I should say, sorry. Men, males, whatever. <laughs> but uh, they they have them as well. And then uh, a shout out also to designers Durdu and Michael Lombard. They were um, recently on New York Fashion Week. If you go onto their website, uh, Michael Lombard, Lombard uh, he focuses and makes amazing designs, punk leather designs, amazing. Durdu, they make affordable luxury, glamorous gowns, just really fun things. And then designer a Sam, she has, um, she designs these beautiful, uh, colorful designs, uh, the A concept um, and Studio De Maxi and, uh, whew, okay. <laughs> I, but, but, in case you don't know, um, Halima, can you show them the sleeve? Oh yes, yes I can. Oh gosh, let me, let me stand up real fast. But the sleeve, it's a cape sleeve and it's fully reversible. <laughs> I don't think we have time for me to take it off, but when I do and I flip it around, then this part is uh, black, uh, this color, and then the rest is black, but it's an amazing design. Thank you, A4. Okay, I'm done. 
Awesome. Uh, and to really, all the other designers that you want to see in DC, just check out my YouTube page. Sorry, just we were short on time. I love everybody. Thank you. <laughs> all right, we only got like less than two minutes. Uh, Madeline, someone, someone else you want to plug? Uh, no, if you do want to do any of the work like I'm talking about, go to the theater lab. They are amazing. Dwayne, take it away. <laughs> I think you're on mute. We can't hear your voice. Oh no. Crud. Um, okay. Uh, on on Instagram, the original Derek Weston Brown, incredibly uh inc incredible writer. Uh definitely follow and get to know him. Um holler at Makers Lab DC. Um just just learn about Makers Lab. Uh, um and all of the people connected. Please. We gotta go. Love y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Peace.